Welcome back, gang. Thanks for sticking with us. We are continuing to talk about uh, the Canadian Cancer Society. They have a ball coming up on April 16th, the uh, Daffodil Ball, a big fundraiser for them. Uh, with us is Courtney Pringle Carver and Paul Blumhauer. Thank you so much for sticking with Thank us. You. Thank you. Um, so you're just before we went to break. You're talking mm -hmm. about the survivors table. Um, so uh, there's all kinds of different stuff. There's going to be different survivors that are there. Really an interesting, um, I say mix because uh, there's, there's people of all kinds of different uh, age groups. Um, tell us a little bit more about this uh, about this table. So the survivors table is um, if there is one thing that I feel really proud of. Uh, with respect to the work of the committee this year. And, and again, let me say they've been absolutely wonderful. We're setting new records. It's proving by all accounts to be successful. It, it's this idea of a survivor's table. And when we go to these events, it, it's sometimes easy to forget the reason why we're there. So we decided to come up with a survivor's table. And at that table, we would have individuals who have survived cancer, obviously. Uh, we made it a priority to find people who have uh, different backgrounds, men, women, different age groups, to really illustrate the point that cancer can affect anybody. And so Paul, through his involvement on the committee, uh, let everybody know that you know, he was a cancer survivor and he agreed to be profiled, which of course is quite courageous because not everybody is prepared to share their story publicly, but Paul was. So one of the partnerships we have in the community is with a local photographer, Denis Duquette, who many people know and his work is it's, it's just absolutely outstanding. He took pictures of all of our cancer survivors, again one of whom is Paul. We have a few teenagers, uh, a woman in her 60s, grandmother, a middle-aged woman. He took their pictures, we wrote up short bios, and not only will they be at the survivor's table at the event, at the front of the room, their stories are also featured in the event program. Well, that's fantastic, and I mean, what's great about it is that they are survivors. They're great yeah. stories, and Paul, I want, I want to talk about your story, because mm -hmm. um, I mean, one of the things that, uh, that you mentioned right off the bat when we started to talk today is that mm -hmm. cured. You're cured. cured, and it's not something you often hear when you, when you get into this enough. stuff. No, uh, absolutely. Uh, as of three years ago, uh, my oncologist has actually used the word cured, and that's a C word that pe more people need to hear. So through events like this, hopefully more people can uh, hear that word. Mine was uh, colon cancer, and it, they took a very aggressive approach, and uh, because of that, I'm able to stay that now. And as Courtney said, it takes a while. My, uh, it, people that knew me uh, individually, I've never shied away from telling them. But this is sort of the first time that I'm stepping forward to kind of go, you know, listen, this can happen. You can, you can make it. Well, so. uh, it's an important story to tell, uh, but I'm sure it's not necessarily always an easy one. Uh, you know, when you go through this, it's, it, you know, no matter how you kind of go through it, I imagine mm -hmm. you, no matter what, at the end of the day, you're kind of going through it yourself you know you, yeah. you can be surrounded by friends and family of course but it's it is still a personal struggle so to be able to you know mm -hmm. open up about that uh, yeah. I think is, is uh, as courageous as battling the disease itself give us an idea of, of your story how old were you when when you got diagnosed and what was what was your mindset back then um, I was in my uh, early 40s and uh, I had just moved to Moncton the summer before, and I knew I had stomach problems. And then as the spring progressed, they grew uh, consistently worse. And of course, everybody says, well, why didn't you go to the hospital? And I did go to the hospital. I w actually went and waited in an emergency for 10 or 12 hours. Looking back on that, and I, I'm not going to take anything away from emergency, it was me. I didn't tell the truth about what my symptoms were. You try to be tough. You don't admit exactly what it is you might have even though WebMD has told you all the worst things. But, so I didn't tell them all my symptoms to their fullest extent. So looking back on it now, that was my fault. Uh, th several months later, uh, a manager that I worked with who had been on vacation came back, looked at me, said, when's the next person in? I said, eight o'clock. He goes, eight o'clock, you're going to the hospital. Uh, I had lost so much weight by that point. My life consisted of going to work, coming home, feeding my cat, and crawling in bed. And that was about it. So I needed somebody to finally do that. That time, I went directly from triage to a bed. So because 
I, admit, I probably looked that bad, and I admitted what my symptoms were. And as I said, part of this is men. We've got to tough it out. Well, that's, that's so true. I mean, I'm, I'm happy you, you, you bring that up because mm -hmm. I find that's the, it's, yeah. it's a growing kind of concern. And you see, you see ads now really focusing just mm -hmm. on men and just the idea of going to get a, a regular checkup. Yeah. You see, I mean, I'm, I'm guilty of it. You know, yeah. like I, I don't want to go to the hospital or go see my doctor any no. more than the next guy. But it's, it's so important to try yeah. to you know, curb these things early on. No, exactly, which is why I wanted to uh, do something like this to say that if you do take care of it, and I took care of it far too late. You know, I waited and I was extremely ill. And uh, I had stage two cancer, so it affected my colon, my bowel, and my bladder. And, you know, could it have been caught earlier? Yes, you know, depending on your situation or what tests they can and what you tell them is wrong with you. So, you know, tell the truth, you know, admit you're sick, so. Uh, from there, I mean, you, you mentioned how despite this diagnosis, mm -hmm. you stayed relatively optimistic throughout your, yeah. uh, why is it, how were you able to find that kind of, that kind of courage and that strength? One is, I guess part of it is the word cancer was never used till the day I was released from the hospital. So I went in, I had surgery. It was always a lump or a mass. So in my head, it was like my tonsils. It was, I'd get them out. I'm sick now. Let's get them out. I'll feel better. So then I got out. Honestly, I didn't realize how bad it was until I w first went to see the oncologist. So here I am at the oncology center, and I have you know, this gentleman uh, doctor that deals with cancer patients every day, and he's reading my file going, oh, you've been through so much. And I'm like, oh, okay. You know, I'm, I had surgery and, I, and got over it. And uh, went on from there and so I went through six months of chemotherapy as well as two months of radiation therapy. Through that time I was extremely lucky in, and I kept going, when can I go back to work, when can I go back to work? So a big part of that is just being social. I was the manager of a Starbucks at Chapters at the time and so seeing people every day, you know, I wanted to get back to that. I wanted to get back to my normal because it's people that lift me up. So keeping that attitude, yeah, I want to get back to work. You know, okay, I'm done being sick, and uh, I don't know. It's just you can look, you can walk at these things and have, you know, oh woe is me, or you can go, okay, that's wh what do I have to do next? You know, let's deal with this. Absolutely. The day before my surgery, when my surgeon uh, described it to me, and then he looked at me because I wasn't reacting, and he had told me horrific things that could happen. He made me repeat it back to him because he didn't think I quite understood. And he goes, you understand? I'm going, yes, but there's nothing I can do about it. I'm in your hands. You're the surgeon. So, you know, let's get through this. And then when I wake up tomorrow, I'll deal with whatever it is then. So. Yeah. Well, I, I have to say, I don't know if a, a everybody would have the kind of, I don't know if it's presence of mind or courage to be able to take that approach on something that they can be so so scary, really, to be yeah. perfectly honest Absolutely. with you. I think that's, yeah. uh, I mean, it speaks a lot to, to, to you. Uh, and I love the fact that you mentioned the social aspect of it. I mean, mm -hmm. I get the impression that just your work, your family, your friends was a Absolutely. big help to get you through this. It was incredible. One, one of the hardest things was making the phone calls to tell people I was sick. Like that is the one that stays in my mind forever, of having to t call people and say, listen, I'm going to have surgery. And again, they hadn't used the cancer word yet. So I'm really glad I didn't have to call and say that, so that's even a hard one. Uh, but no, it, having, you know, I have my Moncton mom and dad here uh, who took care of me. You know, my sister flew in from Vancouver, and friends and family were there. I still have every, uh, all 72 Get Well cards. Mm -hmm. You know, I still have every one of them. So, you know, the support is there. It's absolutely phenomenal. Uh, well that, that's fantastic. And uh, one thing that you mentioned, we only have a little bit of time left, um, uh, but you said that uh, recovery, when you said to me, you said recovery is about 99% mental. Explain that a little bit. Uh, it really is because you're going through this horrific thing and you have to allow yourself uh, time to heal. So there are going to be days when it's, you know, you're down and you can't do it. But part of that recovery, and I told you my aunt ga or gave me the best advice of no matter how far you think you can go, go halfway there because you have to come back. Hmm. And that was phenomenal because I kept wanting to push it. And I also like the fr you know friends of mine let me do stupid things. It's like, well, I have to go get my drugs at the hospital, and I was or at the drugstore, and I was standing there swaying. It was too much for me. 
recovery and, as I said, the, the treatment that I received here in Moncton at both hospitals. So I was treated uh, at the oncology center in uh, at the Moncton Hospital and that was treated very well. Then I also did my uh, radiation at the George Dumont and they have absolutely amazing uh, radiation technology oncologists and the technicians, everybody is just top notch. They understand they're there to help you save your life, but you also have a life. And so getting past that is, you know, makes a real difference. That is a, a fantastic, and I mean, we actually had um, uh, the folks in the Tree of Hope, uh, mm -hmm. they raised money for, for uh, the Oncology Center at the Dumont as mm -hmm. well. Uh, just some really great people, again, yep. great causes. Um, Cancer.ca, you can make donations anytime. Sure, you didn't make it to the ball. Unless you were one of the ones who got the tickets, but you can go to cancer.ca at any time to make donations. Uh, make sure you check it out, and a great cause. Thank you so much for being on the show, gang. I Thank really you. appreciate it.